So what I'm going to do today is uh, take you to a specific moment in history, to a specific moment in history, which is the 20th century before this, the Second World War, between the two wars, actually, and look at two figures, Pirene and Ernst Herzfeld, and try to see how they were uh, thinking, uh, actually in the same way, and coming to a very similar conclusion. One will establish something for the history of Islamic art, and the other one establish something for the history of the Mediterranean. And I must say that I'm still uh, much thinking of the last sentence of Amara from yesterday. If you remember, he finished his lecture with a very strong uh, word like, give us back our Mediterranean. Now, this, this, this sentence, I must say, was just working in my head the whole night. And I was still thinking about it. Because first of all, when Amara is saying, give us back, it means that someone, first of all, took it out of us. Second, that we lost it. And the question is, when did we lost? When did we lose the Mediterranean? How is it that we need to get it back? And who took it from us? And the, the last question, and this is something that relates to my question, to, to my lecture, is give it back, give, give back our Mediterranean. That means that there are some people that could claim that they own the Mediterranean. And I wonder who are these people. Now I'm going to speak of two people who are going to claim that they own also the Mediterranean. So, the um, global turn in the field of art history and history today has dictated on us, art historians, several consideration and restriction for studying the visual world around us, and most of all, framed art history and history within a theoretical concept of reading of art and, art and artifact and document. It is beyond the scope of this paper to go into details while questioning the ramification of applying some of the new global turn principle to the study of the history of the visual arts, like for example the re-employment of concepts such as decentralization and especially de-westernization and much term as provincializing Europe. The disclosing of contact zone and peripheries as the playing stages for the dynamic of artistic uh, networking and of course the elusive term mobility which puts dynamic of transmission of people materials and ideas. All of these are actually related to the Mediterranean. And yet, I would like to focus on this short study as another aspect that involves a new dimension of global art history and history. I would like to call our attention to another level of inquisition, the dynamic sphere of what I called intersection or intersecting historiographies. In the core of this paper are an exemplary case, uh, the two main scholar figures, Henri Pirenne and a, um, Ernst Herzfeld. Both of them were academically active. You see Herzfeld on that side, Henri Pirenne, of course, on the other side. Both of them were academically active and productive during the first half of the 20th century, between the two worlds war. In this respect, the writing of these two protagonists of this paper and the studied object of our scholarly observing eyes, Pirenne and Herzfeld images namely their erudite mind, and even more explicitly, their cognitive modus operandi for making arguments and organizing material in specific order to produce knowledge from the domain of this uh, form the domain of this inquiry. Moreover, these issues are being discussed as reflecting the collective or perhaps global intellectual scheme at the beginning of the 20th century, a scheme that seems to form ways of arranging and presenting historical evidence, literary and visual alike, and making of ration, namely endowing this evidence with meaning and significance. Pirenne was mainly interested in the history of Europe, and especially in the moment in which the antique Roman world cheesed and paved the way for the birth of the following period termed by him Middle Ages. The intermediate age needed for the establishing the particular story of European history as the one made up of moment of lost and found of knowledge. Thus, 
Although occupied by the birth of the medieval time in the Latin West, Pirene seems to conform to the common wide Western frame of arranging historical knowledge in which the medieval period appeared as the necessarily required and preparatory one for the presenting the following epoch of the Renaissance as the age of the rediscovering the lost classical world. The second figure is Ernst Herzfeld, whose interest lies in the ancient history of the Near East, but also in the birth of a new aesthetic phenomenon called Islamic art at the heydays of late antiquity. Thus, both Piren and Herzfeld touched upon a specific intersecting moment in history in which, to use the title of Piren book, could be termed as the age of Muhammad and Charlemagne. Better said, actually, Harun al Rashid and Charlemagne, the era around the year 800. Piren focused on the age of Charlemagne and on the shift of centers of power in European history that took place within the establishment of the Carolingian dynasties. <coughs> dynasty, sorry, over the Alps in the city of Aachen. Herzfeld, obsessed with the question about the zero hour, the Stunde, Lul, Stunde Null of Islamic art, focused on the history of the construction of the city of Baghdad, the new capital city of the Abbasid power on the shores of the river T Tigris. And so, in the founding of Baghdad by the Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur in 762, a specific moment marking a major shift in the history of Islamic architecture. My intention is to look as if under magnifying glass and the intersection, intersecting historiography of the writing of these histories of Europe and the Near East in the very same conjecture of time, namely between these two world wars. Through this vein of investigation, I am at understanding another global network that engage a traffic of academic knowledge as related to the writing of histories, arts, and architecture. In addition to the usual global network related to the movement of artistic ideas and technique, I would like to shift our attention to the mobility of ideas, academic ideas, concerning the writing of the past and the periodization. Henri Pirenne, 1862, died 1935, is well known for his controversial book, Muhammad and Charlemagne. This book published after Pirin's death in 1935. The book appeared for the first time in English in 1954. Was already completed the book as a manuscript circa of 300 pages on, my, on May 4th in 1935. It was the crowning achievement this is one of the papers of the manuscript uh, that was found after he died in 35 and was collected by his son. It was the crowning achievement of his last years of work and the climax of many years of research, as his son, Jacques Pirenne, tells us in the introduction to this book. And Pirenne's son added, adds that it was, and I cite, the problem of the end of antiquity and the beginning of the Middle Ages that had always occupied him, his father, end of citation. Most, and that while being interested in the economic history of Europe, Piren was exposed to the close relationship that existed between the conquest of Islam and the formation of the medieval Occident. The book is indeed the culmination of Piren's thought on the making of medieval Europe and the birth of the middle class power and the important role that played in the creation of modern economy, economy and culture. In fact, the gist of his book was already published in 1920 in the Revue Belge de Philologie et d'Histoire in an article entitled Mohammed et Charlemagne. 
the Piren thesis was thereafter delivered in different conferences, public lecture. It was first held in the International Historical Congress in Brussels in 1923 and later on the Oslo, in Oslo in 1928. Moreover, a series of lectures on this subject were held by Piren between 1931 and 32 at the University of Brussels and several other were also delivered in the form of public lecture in the universities of Lille in 1921. In Columbia College in New York in 1922, all these are the lecture of Mohammed and Charlemagne. In Cambridge in 1924, in Montpellier in 1929, in Algiers in 1931, in Rome at the Institut Historique Belge in 1933, and in Cairo in 1934, and again in Rome in 1933. So, uh, sorry. The main thesis of this article concluded in the final chapter of part two of Piren, Mohammed and Charlemagne, and controversial, controversial as it is, was that the main cause for the rapid end of the break with the tradition of antiquity was the rise of Islam and its speedy conquest of the eastern and southern part of the Mediterranean Basin. A century of metamorphosis and transition was defined and demarcated by Piren. It was dated between 650 and 750, and around 800, however, with the consolidation of the new empire over the Alps. The medieval Occident was formed. Charlemagne appeared, therefore, as the product of the global affairs in these changing times of hege hegemonies at the Mediterranean Basin. The emergence of Charlemagne and the Carolingian power over the Alps appear then as the result of the varied interlinked histories in which Byzantium, the Abbasids, and the Umayyads of Al-Andalus played the major role. Thus, around 800, Islam was the major driving power that put history into motion, dictating a particular path, as Piren even say, and I quote him, Islam had shattered the Mediterranean unity which the Germanic invasion had left intact. It was the most essential event of European history which had occurred since the Punic Wars. It was the end of the classical tradition. It was the beginning of the Middle Ages. And it happened at the very moment when Europe was on the way to becoming Byzantinized. That's the uh, citation of uh, Piren. The important paragraph to which I will come, this important paragraph to which I will come later, clearly illustrate the main approach of Piren of interpreting historical events. It is the idea of rapture caused by an outside power that triggered a shift in the history of the Mediterranean. The outside power is defined as stranger to the Mediterranean, and therefore the concept of discontinuity is applied. Arguable as this disruption and discontinuity indeed were, and we know that it has been revised more than once, this Piren thesis, they were accentuated by Piren in this paragraph by juxtaposing very clearly words such as end and beginning. You remember the end of antiquity, beginning of the Middle Ages, the, class, the end of the classical, beginning of the medieval. The idea of the birth of Islam presents a turning point in the whole history of the Mediterranean. It em emphasized in Piren, Muhammad, and Charlemagne. This means that Islam is the break in the seemingly ongoing syncretistic genre of interactions in the ancient classical world. Piran, in a certain discourse devoted to the expansion of Islam in the Mediterranean, compares the past histories of conquest in the Mediterranean world to the Arab conquest of the seventh century. He defines it as a unique and totally different. It is worth citing this paragraph here. The Germans, I cite, became Romanized as soon as he entered Romania. The Roman, on the contrary, became Arabized as soon as he was conquered by Islam. It is true that well into the Middle Ages, certain small communities of Copts and Nestorians and above all Jews survived in the midst of the Muslim world. Nevertheless, the whole environment was profoundly transformed. There was a clean cut 
a complete break with the past, where his power was effective, it was intolerable to the new master that any influence should escape the control of Allah. His law, derived from the Quran, was substitute for Roman law, and his language for Greek and Latin. When it was converted to Christianity, the empire, so to speak, underwent a change of soul. When it was converted into Islam, both his soul and its body were transformed. The change was as great in civil as in religious society. Uh, this is problematic, of course, and the whole idea of uniqueness that we hear even here is becoming really problematic, uh, and uh, I will come to it by the end. The use of the adverb and adjective such as profoundly, clear-cut, and complete, and the use of the metaphor of a change of body and soul transmit the idea of a total rapture, which mark an end of one phase and the start of another. And Pyrene, Pyrene uh, even adds, and I cite, with the Islam, a new world was established on those Mediterranean shores, which had formerly known the syncreticism of the Roman civilization, a complete break was made which was continued even to our own day. And force two different and hostile civilization existed on the shores of Mare Nostrum. And although in our own days the European had subjected the Asiatic, he had no assimilated him. The sea, which had hitherto been center of Christianity, became its frontier. The Mediterranean unity was shattered. End of citation. But in fact, most Piran's thought seems to appear already in his no less influential book, Medieval Cities, Their Origin and the Revival of Trade, which was first published in English in 1925 and which was based on a series of lectures delivered between October and December in 1922 in several American universities. Most of his Muhammad and Charlemagne ideas were formulated in the first chapter, The Mediterranean, of this book. The closing paragraph of this chapter emphasized the main thesis of Piran, already in this book, in his Muhammad and Charlemagne, which will come later by the, uh, on the Mediterranean global world. And I cite from this first book, Medieval Cities. The Mediterranean had been a Roman lake. It is now became, for the most part, a Muslim lake. From this time on, it separated instead of uniting. The east and the west of Europe, the tie which was still binding the Byzantine Empire to the Germanic kingdoms of the west was broken." End of citation. Moreover, in several other chapters, Piran is very clear about arguing without Islam, the Frankish Empire would probably never have existed, and Charlemagne without Muhammad would be inconceivable. Piran also argued that with the blow that Islam gave to the global trade in the Mediterranean basin, the closed domestic economy of the economy of the no markets substituted the economy of the exchange of each demands, namely dominus, the feudal manor, instead of conversing and trading with the elsewhere spaces. And this constitute, as he said, from this time a little world of its own. It lived on itself and, its, and for itself in the traditional Im uh, immobility of a patriarchal form of a government, and that's the birth of the city, the medieval uh, city of Europe. The last deductive here hypothesis illustrates how Piran's logical mind was at work clearly operating within the frame of cause and effect principle, and yet the concept of simultaneously was no less intriguing for him. And I think that is also very important, that he thinks of simultaneously, things, things are happening in the Mediterranean, and one situation in, for example, Baghdad and Al-Mansur is going to affect Europe on the other side in Aachen. For he says, there is obvious more than mere coincidence in the simultaneous simultaneity of the closing of the Mediterranean by Islam and the entry of the Carolingian on the scene. There is the distinct relation of cause and effect between the two. The Frankish Empire was fated to lay the foundation 
mission of the Europe of the Middle Ages, but the mission which, is, which it fulfilled had an essential period condition to the overthrow of the traditional world order. Without Islam, the Frankish Empire would probably never have existed, and Charlemagne without Muhammad would be inconceivable. Ernst Herzfeld was born in Germany, 1879. He died in 1948. So you see, they are almost the same age. It's only um, 10 years uh, between them uh, of working as scholars. And as I show, probably every, any one of them knew of the other and its publication, of course. Born in Germany near Hanover, Herzfeld was trained as an architectural historian and as ancient Orient expert, namely a Cirolo. His career started as an archaeologist between the years 1903 and 1904, 1905. He excavated in Assur, later acted as an expeditor mainly in Iraq and Iran, conducted a trip along the Euphrates and the Tigris with Friedrich Sare, excavated again in Iraq in Samara between 1911 and 1913, and took the professorship of the Technical University of Berlin in 1902. His career in Germany abruptly ended in 1935, and he was forced, like many other scholars of Jewish origin, to leave Nazi Germany. Between 1936 and 1944, he was a faculty member at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. A few years later, in 1948, he died in Basel. The fact in fact, the idea of rupture was no strange for Herzfeld. Like Piran, Herzfeld was occupied with the demarcation of the moment in history that indicated the birth of the new era, the Stunde Null of Islamic art. He was obsessed with the systematization of Islamic early architecture. His full participation in the wide debate on the dating of the facade of Meshatta that was rebuilt in 1903 in Berlin in Pergamon Museum. Well, this is the, the, the famous Meshatta facade. It's a Umayyad palace of the uh, um, end of the first half of the 8th century that was taken from the Ottoman Empire. It was given as a present from Abdul Hamid uh, to the Kaiser and was brought to Berlin. This is already the way it is in Berlin, but that's an archive uh, picture that shows how it was wrought. It was, of course, cut into pieces and brought to Berlin and then rebuilt in Pergamon Museum in 1903. And the debate on this facade clearly illustrates this notion uh, of the defining Islamic art. The title of Herzfeld article published in Der Islam in 1910 is modern revealing. Die Genesis der Islamischen Kunst und das Meshatta Problem. That means the, the birth of Islamic art and the problem of Meshatta. It must be noted that the substance the subtitle of Piran book, Medieval City, also refer, refers to the concept of Genesis, because the Medieval City, the subtitle reads, their origins and the revival of trade. And the title of Piran main major last chapter, Muhammad and Charlemagne, is the beginning of the Middle Ages, like the, the Genesis uh, that uh, uh, Ernst Hertha is using for Meshatta. However, the date of this facade raised the interest of many scholars in the field and thus illustrate how one sole monument could reflect the clash of art historian theories on the development of style and evolution of architecture in the art of the late antiquity and the Near East. I don't have time to speak about it. There were a lot of debate about this facade when it came to Berlin. No one knew exactly if it is Islamic. Some said that it is pre-Islamic, Sasanian. Others said it's Byzantine. There were some people even talking about and Ghassanid uh, works of art, Byzantine work of art, so no one knew how to place it in time. And here, Ernstfeld, in 1910, in an argumentation, uh, put a time for this facade, claim it to be actually a day art of liturgy, the art of melange that is happening by the late antiquity and creating the beginning of of Islamic art. Do I have uh, enough time or do I have to? 
go. I don't see the time here. Okay. Um, much involved in several expeditions in Mesopotamia, which were either supported by the Prussian Academy in Science and the American Oriental Explora Exploration Fund of the University of uh, Chicago, Herzfeld was fully aware of his participation in resurrecting a world lost in memory of humankind. And more importantly, of the significance of this excavation to reconsidering our knowledge about the genesis of our culture. He was involved in archaeological sites that were to mark the beginning of civilization, not only of Islam, Babylon, Assyria, Persepolis, and so on. His involvement with excavation in Mesopotamia in mainly Assyria and Babylonian sites brought to his conscious the idea of genesis or birth of cultures. Herzfeld is therefore a scientist to aim in clearly targeted the disclosing natal moment of civilization. I'll do. And yet, as nature and any scientific evolution paradigm might suggest, birth also bound to incubation, a preparatory phase in time. The Umayyad Palace of Meshatta served Herzfeld as the best example for this model of systematization because Meshatta marks both the end of the incubation and the turning point after which the road was uh, uh, made to leading towards the birth of Islamic art. I don't have time to say more about it, but it seems that he takes the same time of 650 to 750 and makes out of this time the moment of the incubation of Islamic art with Meshatta at its top, and then in 750 when Piren would claim the beginning of medieval time and around the Carolingian uh, dynasties uh, in 800, he will argue for the beginning of the Islamic art with the city of Baghdad, the round city of uh, Baghdad uh, at that uh, time. And this is just a uh, the ground plan of Baghdad that he would suggest. This is very interesting, but that was never excavated. It's all speculative, but here he is making of Baghdad a beginning of Islam with an ideal city which is round with all its uh, problematic. What I want to show here, I'm just going to conclude uh, now, that um, both of these uh, scholars are actually working at the same time. They are working also with the idea of rupture in their mind for explaining historical event and beginning of eras. One will create a beginning of an era for Islamic art, the other one the beginning of an era of medieval time, which will be very much accepted because it's produce all the needed moment, the incubatory moment, the medieval time, for the Renaissance that will be praised later as the great moment of the Mediterranean and Europe. So they are working in, in, in a similar way, in also working on the idea of a beginning of a city, once is Baghdad and once is the medieval cities of the Mediterranean and creating a, a similar uh, uh, sort of um, historical interpretation for the Mediterranean. I would like just to end with a citation of Jacques Le Goff in uh, the introduction that he wrote for the book of Piran when the book of Piran, Muhammad and Charlemagne was uh, uh, reprinted uh, in German for a new edition in 1963 in the book Muhammad and Karl de Grossen and um, he said was bleibt that means what remains of Piren and he said that and I would like to cite uh, Jacques Legoff and at the end Piren's thesis and be it true or false has transformed the gaze of all those who like Piren raised later the same question about the birth of the Middle Ages and I would even say that the same could be applied to Herzfeld because the Herzfeld thesis of Baghdad has transformed the gaze of all those who, like Herzfeld, raised the same question about the genesis of the authentic or the unique Islamic art. Thank you.